Good morning, First United. I send you greetings through our virtual way of worshiping today. Um, as you are aware, church is canceled today out of caution uh, because we want to ensure all members are protected and safe. Um, just so you know, the task force and I will keep you updated moving forward on how in-person worship services uh, will look each week. So just kind of bear with us. This is a constantly changing situation, as you know, um, and I send my sincere apologies um, if there was any confusion um, on my part uh, about this. So, um, but I'm glad you're able to tune in here. This is one of those moments when we're grateful that God has provided us technology because we do like to be in our church building. We do like to be in the sanctuary, absolutely. But one thing we do have to always remember is that we can worship God anywhere. And that's certainly going to be true today during the first Sunday of Advent. couple announcements here I want to go over with you. Uh, the Advent Bible study that was going to take place um, is still going to take place, but we're going to move that to Zoom. So if you signed up with Karen in the office, you're going to be receiving a Zoom invitation uh, to log in on Monday at 630. Uh, for those who can't participate and are still interested in listening to the recording, um, I will record it and then I can send it out later to anyone who is interested. So even if you can't log in at that specific moment, that's okay. Just let me know and I can get you that recording, no problem. Um, we're looking at probably about 30 to 45 minutes worth of a study, um, but it's going to allow us to really focus on Advent and really get our hearts in that time, in that season for us to remember, you know, why do we do what we do? Why do we worship? Why are we preparing? You know, there's more to that story, um, the Christmas story, than what we even imagine sometimes. And so this is one of those studies that's going to help us to really reflect on that. A couple other announcements. Uh, please remember that while we are closed for in-person worship today, uh, your tithings and offerings are a very important piece in keeping the church operational and functioning. It's, it's stewardship. Uh, now, we do have a variety of ways that you can still send your offerings, postal mail, you can drop them off at the church, uh, you can even use online giving. Um, if you have concerns about how to give or ways to give, um, I would encourage you to reach out to Chuck Marsh, um, who is our finance chair, and he will be happy to assist you any way that he can. Um, I also want to mention to you about Christmas Eve. This year, there will only be one Christmas Eve service.
Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. At this time, will you please join with me in our call to worship? Can you hear it? Can you feel it? Christ is coming. We place our hope in the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, the infant lowly. Can you see it? Can you smell it? Christ is coming. We place our hope in the small infant child born of God. Can you taste it? Can you sense it? Christ is coming. We place our hope in an infant born in the margins of society. Come, friends, the season of Advent begins. We gather to worship Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Will you please join with me in our opening prayer? Will you please bow your heads? Good morning, Heavenly Father. Christ is coming. We come as your sons and daughters this morning, recognizing that we have entered into the season of preparation for your son, Jesus Christ, to come into the world and to make his presence known to all people, to make your presence known to the world that you have not forgotten your people and realize that we all need a savior and Jesus Christ is that savior of the world. We are so thankful that you loved us so much to send us your son, as we begin this Advent season, let us all have hearts that are preparing and listening to your Holy Spirit and to its direction. This morning, we specifically want to know and sense that Holy Spirit in our hearts and around us as we worship together virtually and learn more and more about this amazing Christmas miracle. Let us lay down what is distracting to us this morning to you because we all truly want to put all of our attention on you. Lord God, we pray all these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, I'm going to turn it over for our time of special music.
As we come time now for sharing of some joys and concerns here, um, I'm looking at the list here and I just wanna highlight a few, um, but know that all those on the prayer list are being prayed for daily. Um, and as your pastor, I can assure you that I have been praying for all these individuals daily, twice a day, sometimes even three times a day. Um, and prayer is certainly working. So I know that you all are also praying for all those on the prayer list, but I just want to lift before you a few this morning. We want to continue to remember the families of uh, Norma Haynes, Betty McConnell, um, and Kevin Johnson. Um, we know blessed are those that mourn for they will be comforted. And, and especially during the holiday time, uh, we know that that can um, make losing someone just a little bit harder. We already know it's hard. Um, and difficult, but um, holidays can make it a little bit more challenging too. So we want to make sure we remember them in prayer. Continue to pray for uh, Dallas and Linda Martin, as well as uh, Dia and Sean uh, for their recovery as well. Also remember all those on homebound who are not coming out because of the pandemic uh, for whatever reason. We just want them to know that, that they are prayed for as well and that they are loved and cared for. If you continue prayers for my grandmother, Martha, um, 95 years old, she's just not doing very well at all. Um, she does have assistance coming in uh, during the day at home to help her. Um, some days are better than others. So just continue to remember her in your prayers and continue to remember my wife, Tiffany, as well, um, as her journey to full recovery is, is going to take many months, but she is well on her way. And so just please continue to pray for her good progress. At this time, I would like to invite you to bow your heads uh, for a moment of prayer. And then at the end, you can join with me as well in saying the Lord's Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we pause during our morning worship service to lift up several individuals this morning. We want to lift before you the families of Norma Haynes and Betty McConnell and Kevin Johnson. For we know blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. Provide them the comfort, especially during this holiday and in these challenging times, as well as for all those who are remembering loved ones that have been called home. And uh, know that, um, that we all need that comfort. We continue prayers for Dallas and Linda Martin, Dia and Sean and their recovery. We wanna lift before you uh, Martha Ryder this morning as, as her journey continues to be difficult. We wanna continue prayers for my wife, Tiffany and for her good progress. We also wanna pray for all those that are homebound and that are not coming out for whatever reason, but we pray for them and know that they are loved. We also lift up all individuals on our prayer list this morning. For you know all their needs, you know all these individuals, and so we pray for them. Lord God, we also pray for any unspoken requests that we have, Lord, that just because they're not mentioned doesn't mean we do not know or you do not know their needs or concerns, and so hear those needs and concerns this morning. And Lord God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray and say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I'll turn it over um, to the sermon, and we'll get started on that. This morning, our scripture passage is going to come from Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look specifically at verses 1 through 7. Um, but even more, I want to look mainly at verses uh, 1 through 2 into three, just to kind of touch base with where I'm heading with this. So here is Luke chapter two, verses one through seven. Listen to these words. In those days, a decree went out 
from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I first want to begin by sharing with you a story, and I think that many of you can probably relate to this or have had a very, you know, similar experience to this. Um, Back when I was in college, there was a group of us that shared an apartment together on the first floor um, of a section of college-owned apartments. It was great. I mean, if I could consider any college time to be probably the best. It would be that moment, that senior year right there. Um, In that apartment, there were four of us. Fun fact about that though, all of us in that apartment are now pastors. Isn't that interesting? We've all been part of each other's weddings. I mean, it was just a great time uh, to be together in that apartment. But anyway, the point of this is we all took turns going to the store every once in a while. And it was usually weekly. Now this was early on in the college career because, well, as we got further on in the semester, we realized it was just best that we all take care of our own groceries. It took us a little while to figure that out. But anyway, it was my turn that week, and so I went to Walmart with a big list of groceries, loaded up my 1998 Toyota RAV4, great vehicle, by the way, still running today, and I got back to the apartment. I pulled up to the back door so I could literally just unload it. I opened the back door and there were my three roommates sitting there in the living room. So here's what I did. I started carrying in the groceries, bag after bag, sweat after sweat, thinking that they would jump in and help me, but they never moved. It wasn't until I closed the trunk of my 1998 Toyota RAV4 and I closed the back door that led into the living room and I walked in and set the last bags down. And then one of them looks at me and says, well, sorry, Josh, I guess I should have helped you with that. You think? That would have been my response. Of course, I didn't say anything. I was a little upset at the time. Has anyone ever been in a similar situation like that? You know, talk about showing up at the right time, right? I was frustrated. I was upset. They waited until the last possible minute to even offer to help. Maybe you've experienced something like that before, whether it be with groceries or working on a project or even carrying up the Christmas decorations from the basement. You know, we know what it's like to be on the side that says, where have you been? Right? I've been struggling. I've been working. You've been here. I need you to help me. We know what that's like. And I bring this story up to you first because it's what I thought about when I read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, specifically verses 1 through 2. Because it has to deal with God showing up right on time. Now, while my friends in that particular situation may not have showed up right on time, What we know is that God always does show up right on time, and he doesn't let us down. Now, by the way, to make this clear, especially in in case my friends are listening to this, my friends have generally always been there right on time, right when I needed them the most. It was really just that one moment that I thought of that they weren't there. But then I remind myself, I'm not perfect either, and they're human, and I'm human. But please know they're great friends, and they're always there for the most part. 
But anyway, today we're going to begin to focus on the season of Advent. And I really want to focus on that word hope. And we're also going to talk a little bit later on in the sermon today about how God shows up right on time. Now, let's talk about this word hope. We're going to look at the word hope during the entire season of Advent, what that word actually means in terms of our faith and really what it means in terms of today in our present world um, and how God always shows up right on time when we need him the most. So let's think about the word hope. If I asked you to describe or define the word hope, what would you tell me? I think you'll find many of us would have some similarities, but I also think there would be a lot of differences as well. So what is the word hope? It refers to what? An activity of hoping, basically. Or we kind of hope for an object to show up. The content of one's hope, so to speak. By its very nature, hope really stresses two different things. One, hope stresses the future and what we expect and what we want to happen. Two, Hope also stresses invisibility and what that looks like. It deals with things we can't see or haven't received or could be even both. Also, the word hope, for the most part, has a generally positive feeling toward it, right? When we say we hope for a better future or we hope things get better, we're generally relaying a very positive tone. That is certainly true, so please don't think I'm proving that wrong. That is definitely true. I'm often reminded of Romans chapter 8, verses 24 through 25 that says this, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. That scripture verse tells us as Christians that hoping means we believe in something without seeing it. It is the perfect word to start our Advent journey together. Brothers and sisters, Advent is here now. We have arrived in this season of preparing, thinking, praying, studying, worshiping, having times of fellowship, and most importantly, always showing love and compassion. We wait for the baby Jesus born in a manger. We also wait for Christ, the second coming man. But why is this hope? I mean, we didn't physically see it, right? We weren't there. But we don't have to physically see it to believe it or to have that hope. True hope in our Christ is knowing he was born and understanding the importance of his birth and the fact that he's coming again, even though no one knows the day or time, only God knows for that second coming. That's true hope. True biblical hope is a certainty not a guess as the world would use it. Oh, I hope I win the lottery. Okay, that's not a certainty. We kind of wish it, but it's not a certainty. But when we use this word in context with our faith, we hope God is coming to help us. What that really says is we know God is going to help us. Hope means it is a certainty, and Christ calls us all to know and understand the word hope as a certainty. Hope is everywhere. Hope is a frame of mind. Hope is fragile. Hope is wanting your family close by. Hope is putting Christ coming first. Hope is believing in things that we can't see. Hope also has its rewards and blessings. Hope gives us belief in promises, strength and courage to overcome adversity. Hope provides us the ability to seek out the truth and to believe and to endure trials and struggles as patiently 
as we can. There is an acrostic poem that I use to help me sometimes when I think about the word hope. I want to introduce it to you. So let's think about the word hope, H-O-P-E. The H stands for hangs on to the promises. Remember to hang on to those promises. Promises are true and they will happen. O means overcomes adversity. P means pursues truth and believes. And E means endures trials patiently. That is hope. That's the season that we're in. We're hanging on to those promises. We are overcoming adversity. We are seeking and pursuing the truth and believing what we know. And we're also enduring trials very patiently. We know that now in 2020 more than ever. As people of God, we live on hope now more than we ever did before. Hanging on to the promises of Christ our King. And this brings us now to Luke chapter 2. In this passage, we see hope in action. As God shows up right on time. A moment that Jews have been waiting years for is now here. But why is this the right time? Pastor, why not years before? I mean, I've read the Old Testament. I know what they've been through. Why is he just now showing up? I mean, why not before when the Babylonians and the Assyrians had them held captive? Why not before sin got way out of control? Well, the truth of the matter is, number one, I can't answer those questions, except that without the waiting, we wouldn't have the great testimonies of the many people that have gone before us, like Noah, David, Jeremiah, Isaiah. But then we go back to the question, why now? Why at this very moment? First, we need to understand some historical context here, I think. So let's talk a little bit about this decree that went out from Caesar Augustus. It's interesting to think about the birth of Jesus began during the reign of one of the most interesting men in ancient history. Some would say he's remarkable even. Caesar Augustus, by the way, whose original name was Octavian, he was named after his father, eventually for the attention of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, there's a name you may recognize, ended up eventually adopting Octavian as a son. And within a year of being adopted, many of you may know your history, Julius Caesar was murdered and Octavian ended up with two other people that he was now in power with. Um, those two people were named Mark and uh, Lepidus, who are responsible for splitting the domination of Rome in three different ways. Makes sense. You've got three different people. They split it three different ways. But for decades after, and this is the most important piece, all that really, I mean, it's important, but not as important as this. The Mediterranean world and at that time was filled with wars and violence. And for many of those specific years, there were years of just downright bloody and brutal fighting for power and money in Rome, as well as fighting over provinces. That's an important piece to understanding this passage, because you see, in the world of Augustus, or Octavian, if we go by his birth name, there was a world that Jesus was going to be brought into that was wrecked by war and destruction and brutality and immorality. This is the world Jesus was born into. This is God showing up at the right time, a time when the world needs a savior more than ever before. Now, it is important to note that Caesar Augustus and his authority did change things dramatically um, compared to his predecessors. I mean, he brought peace as he defeated many of his rivals. He brought political skill and brilliance to the table. He brought huge sum of monies from Egypt to pay off soldiers and to help the Roman economy. So in that regard, he did very well. But as great of a man as he was, we have to remember he was still just 
a man. He wasn't the man. He was a man. And he wasn't the savior of the world. For years, Rome um, provided itself with everything it needed. And it always showed the world that this is the importance on being a republic. But then Caesar Augustus would change that even when he arranged for the Roman Senate to give him the title Augustus. And when you translate Augustus, it means exalted and sacred. Now we have a problem. Once the title was in place, the first emperor of Rome was the same as Caesar Augustus. Once again, perfect timing for the savior of the world to enter into the picture. I'm hoping that makes some sense. I would encourage all of you to research more about the history here as you will discover God's perfect timing for Jesus to appear. For all those years and decades, the Jews waited in anticipation for the Savior of the world to make his appearance. God finally responded. And the Jews, they remained hopeful. And once again, what does that mean? A hundred percent certainty that God was going to provide the Savior of the world for his people. God did just that. Now, knowing all of that, let's do the life application piece. What does that mean for us in 2020? First, we need to continue to be hopeful in a world that seems to be very uncertain. We need to be hopeful in God because he's providing us the savior of the world. He did. We need to be confident and hopeful and put all of our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And remember those strong words of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent us his only son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Second, we are called to remain hopeful that Jesus will indeed come again. His second coming into the world. Meaning what? We have 100% certainty that Jesus will indeed come again. That is what hope is all about. That's why we have this season. God fulfilling his promises. And third, we have to remember that while the leaders of our country are indeed leading us, they are human and they have faults. So what do we need to do for these people? We need to pray for them. Pray that God will use them. But we also need to place our whole trust and faith in God. Because that's 100% certainty right there. We are living in a world that is raging with a pandemic, financial challenges, and even conflict in and around the country and the world. We know these things to be true. But what we also know is God is here. God will deliver all of us in the right time according to his standards. I know these challenges bring anxiety, and they can make it hard to focus on Advent and focus on worship. Trust me, I get it more than you think. I understand these challenges, but God calls us to, to place our hope in him and to prepare our hearts for the birth of Jesus Christ and his second coming. Brothers and sisters, no matter what we all are facing, no matter what mountains you may have to climb, God is here. God will be right there on time. Imagine how Mary and Joseph felt the night Jesus was born and they held their baby in their arms. Many of you can relate to holding your firstborn for the first time. Mary and Joseph had quite a journey in a world that was chaotic. But that didn't change the moment when Jesus was born. Our world is very chaotic. But that should not change the moment that our Savior is born. Don't let it. Focus on God. Stay strong and have that hope, that 100% certainty. 
no matter what is raging around us, do not let that change what we should be feeling and experiencing when Jesus was born. So I want to encourage you this week to look over Luke chapter 2 and really read in to the historical context and truly understand what is happening in this story. And remember to focus on hope and its meaning of being a biblical certainty. Love you all. May God continue to bless all of you as you begin your Advent journeys. Will you please join with me now in the affirmation of faith? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, 
The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you all for tuning in virtually with us this morning. We will keep you updated moving forward what the status of our worship services will be. I want to thank the task force, um, the worship team, um, all the committees, and you for being part of our congregation and for praying for us and working with us during this very uncertain time. I'm thankful for all of you. I couldn't ask for better people to lead and to serve and to be part of our family. Will you receive the benediction? And now as you go, may Christ be the light unto the path that you walk. May the Holy Spirit continue to live and work inside of all of you. And may we all remember the true meaning of the word hope. And let us all prepare for this birth of Jesus Christ as well as the second coming. Go now, go in peace, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God be with you as you go.